delighted to be back in a physics lab. If you know anything about me, I did my undergrad in electrical and electronic engineering, which meant I spent a lot of time in physics labs, and I was scared to death when I walked into this room. Those blackboards filled me full of dread, and I kept having flashbacks to them full of alphabets and equations and letters. I have no idea what they mean, and just sitting there as a student panicking. So I feel really comfortable in this room. Um, <laughs> but anyway, back, back to data and back to what we're talking about today about scientific data. What I want to talk to you about is a new initiative that Nature Publishing Group has recently announced, which is what we're going to do in the scientific data realm, and how we can help scientists get better access to the data they need that underpin the research they publish. For those of you who were at the debate last night, one of the things I said at the end of the debate, which I actually do passionately believe about, is that for the last 500 years, or whatever it is, 1660, so 460, 50, I, my maths isn't working whilst I'm on a camera and in the middle of a load of people, but 453 years. Um, the research object hasn't changed. It's still the same. And we talk a lot about access to content, we talk about a lot about license types, but what we're not addressing is actually the real crux of the problem, which is the research object worked back then really well. In a digital age, the research object potentially doesn't work. And how do we need to change that? And how do we need to revolutionize how science is published to mean that science is accessible to everybody and people can get the information they want and need from science? One thing I've said a number of times, and I'm not going to say it in the way I normally do because I'm on camera, but when I first started my PhD, one of the first things I was taught and I'll be interested to see what the reaction in the room is, is when you write a scientific paper, put enough information in there so people can understand what you've done. But don't put enough in there so they can do it themselves. That's normally, normally the reaction you get, which is an initial, <gasps> and then a, uh, and if you think about it, if you look at research articles themselves, normally you actually have to do something else to understand everything they have done to then replicate the work. And so thinking about the research object and thinking about how science can move forward and how we can sh stand on the shoulders of giants, we need to think about how we can make how the science was collected, how it was interpreted, how the experiments were done, how the data was collected, the actual raw data itself and the conclusions. And making all of those available means that the scientific process becomes transparent. It means if you know how the experiment was done, you know the raw data that was collected, fraud becomes much more difficult to per perpetuate perpetuate because you can actually see what people have done. And what it also means, science becomes much more economical because you can build upon the work that other people have done and you can do it in a simpler and more faster and efficient way. And it fills what the funders want, what scientists want, and ultimately what publishers want. Because publishers want the right product to serve scientists because that's what we're there to do. We're there to work with scientists, we're there to serve scientists, and we're there to make science better, simpler, easier, and faster. That's my preamble. So what I'm going to go through here, and hopefully I'm not going to run out of time in the 15, in the 10 minutes that I have left, is, thank you, is a very few, quick overview of what I'm saying. So in terms of the evolution of research, unfortunately I've picked um, Watson and Crick's paper, so I know I'm in the wrong university, but I will apologize for that now. Um, I also have Cambridge cufflinks on, so please don't shoot me for that. Um, but so if we talk about how research has evolved, and this is all taking a nature-centric point of view, but if you think about the, the first, the sequencing, the, the first identifi identification of this DNA structure, it was one page. People don't think about that, actually. It was one page. It was two authors and one figure. There was no data in it, and I think we had some of the earlier yesterday explaining that, that basically if you look at that paper, there was nothing in there really apart from that pretty picture. Moving forward, the human genome in 2001. There you start to see how science has changed, but it took 50 odd years to get to that point. There were 62 pages, 150 authors, 49 figures, 27 tables. We were so proud of it. It's got a pull out section in print. You can spread it across the table, genius. You know, that's how science had evolved. We can pull out print and move it like that. <laughs> the web for scientific publishing in those days was four years old. Um, moving forward to the Thousand Genome Project, much shorter time scale now, nine years. 12 pages, so we've reduced in length, 76 institutions because we gave up counting authors. We just count them by institutes now. 
12,000 SRA run IDs that were all indexed in the paper and you could get to them online. There was also iPhone and mobile apps. It shows how technology had changed. But you could start to get much more about the paper. And the paper wasn't just about the text. It was about everything else around the text. And ENCODE, just last year, two years later, was 30 papers across three different journals. It was so big and complex, Nature News did an entire infographic about it, which you can see on the right-hand side of the page, showing that there were 15 terabytes of data they spent, somewhere in the region of 50,000 pounds on telephone calls, all of it stored online. There was a Nature Encode website that had threads, meaning you could follow various things by the, um, the genetic structure and the types and the SNPs and all of that, all the way through all the, all the products. It had a mobile page. It had everything. It started to be much more than even the 30 papers. It was actually how can you navigate between all of that? How can you get to the information you want? And that shows that research is changing and changing faster than it ever has done. We started with a 50-year gap, we've ended with a two-year gap. And so the article of the future, if you think about it, has become much more than just even the text and mobile delivery. If you just take the article of the future and you go around, you've got ORCID, you've got molecular entities, data, figures, sections, relevant social media comments, updates, corrections. It becomes a complicated space. It's just not what's in print. It's much more than that. And how has publishers and how as scientists do we amass it? Do we make sense of it? Do we do something with it? So what I'm going to concentrate on in the few minutes I have left is data. And what can we do with data to make it available and to start to move to this world that I think we should be looking at, which is how do you move from just the scientific research in a paper to having access to all the other things around it? Before I do that, a couple of quick snippets that we've got on author surveys. You may not be able to see it, but as these slides will be shared, you can, you can read it at your leisure. But if you look at the data there, the interesting snippets are that, in actual fact, more people delete the data they have than share it publicly. And more people, by a vast majority, delete the data they have than put it in a public repository. That, to me, is quite scary. It may not mean all the data is great, but some of that data would be useful to somebody out there. The majority of data, if you just quickly look at it, is stored locally not, and not shared, and most people share privately with their colleagues. In terms of finding data, respondents indicate that they look in public repositories. Well, the majority of them don't actually put it in a public repository, so they're looking at a very minority, a very small amount of data that's published by a very small amount of people, but a lot of people are looking at it. It shows that the repositories are doing something good. We just need to get over that activation point to get people to share their data. And in terms of using data, there is a widespread, but if you need, even there, if you look at what scientists are saying, over half of them regularly use text, data, information, figures. It's a very important part, and it's something that actually the research article today doesn't present very well. Mark yesterday in Figshare showed some examples of how we can start embedding data in articles at the figure level, and a number of publishers are starting to do that, and hopefully once that data is starting to be shared and embedded, we can do much more with it. So this all leads me back to scientific data. So last week, Nature announced for the first time that we're looking at launching an entire new initiative about scientific data. And that's how we can make the data available and interoperable. But what we aren't going to be doing is hosting the data ourselves. We've taken a lot of time thinking about this. There are many repositories out there, many community standards and community repositories, and that's who we want to work with to actually host the raw data, but enable people to understand what that data is, is where scientific data comes in. And the way to think about it is you have a journal article, you have the data, the two really aren't connected at the minute. Scientific data fills the area in the middle and enables you to understand the research and the conclusions of the research, the data as it's deposited, and then the entire scope about how that data was collected, how it was interpreted, how it could be used. So scientific data aims and is and will be an open access pl platform connecting these concepts called data descriptors, and I'll try and explain a little bit more of what that is in a second, to explain data sets and connect them together and using an APC model so it's fundable and self-sustaining. The data descriptors themselves are a new type of content, and they can be viewed pretty much as secondary material. And they can sit alongside data that's already published in repositories, they can sit alongside papers that are already published about the data. So it doesn't matter where and what information is already out there. They are there to make the data un understandable. But the most important thing is that the data descriptor will be peer reviewed. 
and that starts to give some rigor in terms of how the data is collected and interpreted. And that's a, one of the first times that we're starting to put something and more rigor on data. What's also important is that as part of the data descriptor, we are ensuring that the data is publicly available. And it means that if you submit a data descriptor, you have to have the data available in a public repository. And you have to have followed community guidelines to get that data into that repository, meaning that the standards are being kept with the community and we're making sure that the data is open, that people can get to it. All the content will be published open access and we will make a big effort to make sure that there is metadata available, metadata more than we currently have. MPG currently has a quarter of a billion triples out there for all of our content going back to 1869, including all of the citations, all the bibliographic information as linked data, and it's there as a developer portal. Scientific data will follow that and we, will look, we are currently looking at what elements of the metadata of the data descriptor we will put out under CC0 to enable TDM, text and data mining. There will be an in-house team who are looking at the data descriptors to provide curation to make sure that they meet the standards of the communities and to make sure that they reference the data properly. And there will be an external advisory board that are working with us to ensure that A, the repositories that we support and actually say are the right ones to be using are the right ones and work with the communities, but also feeding back how we need to change. So it's very much more of a community initiative about how we can work with scientists and work with the data. But the data scripter, what is it? I'm trying, it's, I'll try and give a quick overview. Currently, there aren't any available yet on the marketing site. Over the next few months, you will start to see some data descriptors become available for some data sets to start to explain to people exactly what it is. But the data descriptor is only concerned with the facts behind the methodology of data generation, collection, and processing, as I said. It's not to do with conclusions. It shouldn't be to do with scientific integrity. It's got to do with the data and what you did to get that data and put it in a public repository. It contains both a narrative section and a structured curated information section, i.e. the metadata about what is in the data in the repository. And as I said, it can be submitted prior to a journal article. It can be submitted at the same time as a journal article. It can be submitted after a journal article. It's not tied to the publication of the research, because a journal article today is essentially a quick summary of what you've done and then a conclusion. And this is something that's, prime, that's slightly separate to a journal article. And if you look at it just from a flow, on the left you have the facts, which are the data descriptor, the stuff that goes in there. What is the sample data? Where did I generate it? How was it processed? What is the data? Who did what and when? And that forms a very small part of the journal article. In actual fact, most of that information isn't really in the journal article, or if it is, it's in the supplementary information. And the journal article is much more about synthesis, analysis, and conclusions. And so they, these two things support each other, but what it's starting to do is to make the data available about what happened when and what the data is to support that. I've talked about license types, going back to that very quickly. The data itself, the raw data, will be in public repositories, and we'd expect this to be CC0 based on the repository nature that there. So we'll Figshare and Dryad are two that we're supporting, but there are other community databases within there. The data descriptors or the metadata of the data descriptor will be in, within the existing linked data portal, and again, that will be CC0. And the narrative that the authors create will be licensed under what the authors choose. And we're offering three flavors. We have removed a no derivatives license. The authors will choose. And just to summarize very quickly, because I think I'm pretty much there, is we have, so with this project, we've been working with Susanna, and Susanna's just sat over there in the corner who's hiding, but Susanna's based at Oxford University at the e-research lab, and she's been working with us for pretty much the last year or so um, on the development of scientific data, and she will be very much informing us and working with us about how we work with communities and work with data standards. And Andrew, who is the managing editor, will be overseeing the project and making sure that the internal systems work and he comes from a background of publishing, but also um, working with um, EMBO and uh, molecular systems biology. So they're a good team to start driving this forward, and there'll be much more being announced about this over the coming months as we start to build up to launch, um, and we're aiming for launch in spring of next year. Thank you very much.